three is a number. Three cubic meters are a thing. Why? It seems that units make the difference between maths and reality, between platonic ideals and physical quantities. But what are units? I think it's one of the most underrated questions in the foundations of physics. In the international system of units, there are seven base units, second, meter, kilogram, ampere, kelvin, mole and candela. Any other units are products of those, such as meters per second squared makes a unit of acceleration, or kilogram times meters over second square, that's a unit of energy and so on. This video is going to be hard on my British viewers, but no, I'll not convert these into stones per fortnight. That said, uh, we don't actually need all those seven units. In fact, I hope to convince you that we don't need units at all. Take the letter four units, ampere, kelvin, mole and candela. They're related to the first three by constants of nature. For example, ampere is the flow of charge per second. And if you know the elementary charge, you can define ampere from a velocity times that elementary charge times the number of electrons, which has no unit. Kelvin is a temperature, but it's proportional to energy with the factor being Boltzmann's constant. It's really just a convention we even use this. The mole is fixed by Avogadro's number and so on. So this leaves us with seconds, meters and kilograms, measures for time, length and mass. We can now express the units of any quantity as a product of those with some exponents times some of those other constants. This is where things start to get interesting, because as Max Planck figured out, all those units that we normally use are really human baggage. Meters, seconds, teaspoons, gallons per mile, minutes per pint. That's all politics. Planck said, there's one and only one way to make units of length, time and mass from fundamental constants. And those are the natural units that describe our universe. The fundamental constant that you construct Planck's units from are the speed of light, that's C, Planck's constant, that's this H with a bar through it called H bar, and Newton's constant, that's the strength of gravity, usually denoted capital G. Don't get confused by the name. Newton's constant is also the strength of gravity in Einstein's general relativity. It has this name for historical reasons. Planck said, look, you can combine those three to give a mass, a length and a time now called the Planck mass, length and time, respectively. Because gravity is so weak, the Planck time is ridiculously tiny of the order of 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and the Planck length, too, is about 10 to the minus 35 meters. The Planck mass, maybe somewhat confusingly, is actually in a comprehensible range of something like 10 to the minus 5 grams, so a few micrograms. However, it's a huge mass compared to that of elementary particles. You wouldn't use Planck units in everyday life because they're super impractical. We'd have to drag around all those ridiculous exponents of 10 to the minus 40 or so. Okay, you wouldn't use them in everyday life unless you're a physicist because these are the units you want to work with if you talk about, say, the Big Bang or what goes on inside of black holes, quantum gravity and similar things. For example, the space-time curvature at which quantum effects of gravity become strong is one in units of the inverse Planck length square. There's a fairly simple way to see why the Planck unit says something about quantum gravity. Gravity. You can ask, for example, what's the mass that a particle must have so that the quantum uncertainty on the size is below the Schwarzschild radius? If that could happen, then the combination of quantum physics and conventional non-quantum physics stops making sense. So this gives you an estimate for when quantum gravity becomes relevant. And it's easy to estimate. Let's call the mass m. The quantum uncertainty on the size is then delta x equals h bar divided by m times c. Now we want to know when is delta x equal to the Schwarzschild radius related to the mass, which is g times m divided by c square. 
in Saddam, and we can solve quite easily for delta x, which is the square root of gh bar divided by c cube, and that's exactly Planck's length. What this means is that a particle with such a mass would also be a black hole. It sits at the intersection of gravity and quantum physics. We've never measured a particle with such a mass, but they've been hypothesized. They're called Planckions. Some people think that if black holes evaporate, they stop at that size and they leave behind these particles and those could make up dark matter. I digress, but you see that the question of units ties into many other topics in the foundations of physics. So practical or not, Planck units have a fundamental relevance because they're unambiguous. Anyone everywhere who can make measurements can infer them. This is why Planck said, if there's intelligent life out there, these are the units they'd use and we should use them in our communication too. Now, think back of what I said earlier, we can express the units of any quantity as a product of seconds, meters and kilogram with suitable exponents times possibly some other constants that we use by convention. We can now express all of those in terms of products of Planck units. For example, one second is 10 to the 43 Planck times and so on. So far, so obvious. But look, if you know what quantity you're dealing with, you know it's a momentum or an area, then I don't need to tell you which of the Planck units you need to quantify those, because there's only one way to do it. This is why they're base units. See, if you have an area, you know that's length squared. If you have momentum, you know that's mass times length over time. If we now agree that we measure all these in terms of the Planck units, we don't need any units at all. Physicists also sometimes call these natural units. Let me give you an example. If I tell you the energy is one in Planck units, that means it's one times the Planck mass times the Planck length squared divided by the Planck time squared, because there's only this one way to combine Planck units to make a unit of energy. In SI units, that's about a billion joule, and in particle physics terms, that's about 10 to the 16 tera electron volt. This is about the energy that a particle accelerator would have to reach to probe quantum gravity. Okay, so those are natural units. Now, what can we learn from this? There are three things I find fascinating about this. The first is that the Planck units actually are no longer unique. Planck couldn't have known this, but we now also have the cosmological constant. And you can construct natural units by using the cosmological constant C and H bar instead. I think this is an indication that we're missing a relation between the cosmological constant and Newton's constant. The second interesting thing is that you may wonder why do we not have any units with fractional exponents, like a fifth root of mass? Why isn't that a thing? Well, one answer to this is, again, convention. I mean, there's nothing preventing me from defining the fifth root of the Planck mass as one Sabina and call that a new unit. But I think there's a deeper reason for this, which is that such fractional quantities aren't useful because they don't appear in the laws of nature kind of. Actually, fermionic fields have fractional powers, but then again, we don't measure those directly and they don't have fifth roots. The third thing I find interesting is the structure that's behind the three units and the fundamental constants they're built up from. You see, the speed of light converts time to length. A year is a time, a light year is a length. The speed of light also converts energy to momentum. You can then take the inverse of time and length and use Planck's constant to convert that to an energy and momentum respectively. What this means is that the speed of light is a map from time to space and back. And Planck's constant is a map from space-time to momentum space and back. But then what about Newton's constant? What do I get if I multiply these units with Newton's constant? I can do this and that gives me wild things. For example, for a time that would give me cubic meters per kilogram per second. This isn't a unit that we use. Why not?
The reason is that Newton's constants related to gravity, and for gravity we don't deal with energy and momentum. We deal with energy density and momentum flux and curvature. These are defined not as a total, but per volume, their densities. And Newton's constant divided by the fourth power of c converts space-time curvature to these densities. These appear in Einstein's equations. This means that we have a disconnect between the space-time momentum space picture that we use in quantum physics and the curvature density picture that we use in general relativity. I think it's one of the reasons why we're having trouble quantizing gravity. You see, it's all well and fine to say that a particle with some energy doesn't have a definite position, but it makes no sense to say that an energy density doesn't have a position because the density is a function of the position. Okay, you know, I'm afraid now I've lost like 99% of my potential audience with my peculiar interests. In any case, I'm telling you this because I think the topic doesn't get the attention it deserves. What do you think units are? Let me know in the comments. If you prefer reading over watching videos, this video comes with a written companion article on Nautilus, my favorite science magazine. If you aren't already subscribed to them, you should have a look. Nautilus keeps you up to date on the most relevant topics in science today. They frequently have scientists writing for them who will tell you the inside stories. It comes with a digital and a print version and it's just a pleasure to read. They really put a lot of effort into writing and the graphic design is amazing. You notice immediately if you open the print version that it's a high quality production. I've written several contributions for Nautilus myself, but I enjoy this magazine because it tells me what's going on in other areas. What I particularly like is that they cover science in its full breadth, from astronomy to economics, history, neuroscience to philosophy and physics. They'll pick the most relevant topics and give you all the context. You can join Nautilus as a digital-only member or get a print subscription. In addition to full access to all the stories, the Nautilus members receive benefits that includes priority access to events, exclusive products and product discounts. And of course, I have a special offer. If you use my custom link joinnautilus.com slash Sabina, you'll get 15% off your membership subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.